today, our topic, our theme, is trusting in the Word of God. And there was a video I wanted to show you earlier that I forgot to show you. Um, maybe we can show you that at the end of the service if we get down early. But a uh, promotion for the youth to, to gather. Um, really cool video. Anyway, trusting in the Word of God. If you want to turn in your Bibles, you'll be, we'll be reading out of Jeremiah 36, among other passages, but mainly Jeremiah 36. Who reads out of Jeremiah on a regular basis? He's known as the weeping prophet. He, he has a lot of sad things to write, and, and a lot of the things he writes aren't that great and encouraging because he was the last prophet before the downfall of Israel was carried off into Babylon to give you the context of what's going on. Jeremiah was a prophet of God who was told not to marry anybody because he wouldn't be able to have a great marriage. I mean, his, his life was one of singleness and sadness. His life was preaching truth to the, to the people of God, even though they were obstinate and didn't want to hear the word of God. Imagine how that must feel to be having the truth, to proclaim the truth, and no one wants to hear you. Sometimes we may face that in our daily walks. But I want to give you a few things before we get into the depths of this scripture. And I want to pray first, of course. So let's pray, if you would pray with me, that the hearing of God's word would not be in vain and that the preaching of God's word would be Holy Spirit filled and led because I am incapable in and of myself. So, Father God, we thank you for your word, which is true, which enables us to stand on truth. It helps us in all matters of life. It is true in history to the accounts that really happened with your people. And we thank you for preserving it for us today. Lord, may my words be your words. May our ears hear what the Spirit is convicting us today. May our view of the Bible be exalted. May it be higher than it has been before. May our view of you, God, in your holiness be more holy than it has before. Transform us into new living creatures. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. A few things I want to say about trusting in the Word of God. Trusting in the Word of God has to do with God's authority in the Word of God. The authority of God's Word is essentially important in what we're trusting. If we don't have the... Let me back up. The authority comes from the author. Okay, the same root word there. Without the author, say, say okay, here's a book on Billy Graham's quotes. The best guy to ask about this would be Billy Graham, right? So he is the authority on what he said. When it comes to God's word, I am not the authority. God, the author, is the authority on what he has to say. So I want to put that up front, that it is not... There's some duality going on that we'll see in a little bit, but I want to essentially say that the authority comes from God and not man, not any of, it, of the other man-instituted things, uh, even the good things that come up. It is the source of God. That's what it says about itself. And there's three legs that the authority of the Bible comes from that has to stand on, just to kind of set you up before we get into the Scripture. One is the inspiration of God's Word. Two is the infallibility of God's word. And three is the inerrancy. If God could lie, then he wouldn't be trustworthy. But God's nature is that he doesn't lie. So we can trust even one thing he says. But we can trust everything he has to say to us. And even if the arguments that people put up, there's all kinds of stuff. And this is such a deep topic. We can go on and on about this. But I am trying to sum it up for you in like 20 minutes. So this is really challenging. So I appreciate your prayers. But this is fuel for you to go out as you go out this week and share the word of God. How is this not only allowed you to trust in God, but how can you encourage others to trust in God with this too? So I want to read a few verses before we get into Jeremiah. Proverbs 30 verse 5. This is the testimony of the Word of God and what it has to say about itself, okay? Because God's Word testifies about itself. Proverbs 30, verse 5, if you want to write this down, it says, Every word of God is pure. Psalm 19, I'm sorry, Psalm 119, verse 89 says, Your word is settled in heaven. And in verse 52 of 119, it says, It's fixed. It's settled in heaven. 
So its source is not here on earth. Its source is in heaven. Where God resides. Psalm 119, verse 140. Your word is very pure. So it's not just pure, but it's very pure. It's as pure as it gets. Psalm 119, verse 160. These verses aren't going to be on the slides. I'm just kind of setting this up. Okay. Psalm 119, verse 160 says, Your word is true from the beginning. And it's also within God's word compared to seed in Matthew 13 and Mark 4 and Luke 8. And it's also compared to a two-edged sword. It is the standard of all judgment, according to John 12, verse 48 and Romans 2.16. The word of God refers to itself in some interesting ways, too. Have you ever thought about that? How does the Bible talk about itself? The Bible talks about itself. It calls itself the book of the Lord. The book of the law. Good word of God. Holy scriptures. <coughs> law of the Lord. Oracles of God. Scriptures of truth. Sword of the Spirit. The word of God. Word of Christ. Word of life. And word of truth. Did you get all that? It has more than we can comprehend. It says about itself all those things. It is life. It is truth. It is the word of Christ. And all the Bible centers around Christ. From Genesis to Revelation, it centers on Christ. He is the center of history. From Genesis, you have prophecy about the seed of Eve crushing the head of the serpent. And yet you have Christ fulfilling that on the cross by crushing the head of Satan by dying on the cross for our sins. Only God could fulfill prophecy like that. Okay. I hope it set us up a little bit on, on, on what the Bible has to say about itself, but I also want to say this. Just because, some people might say, oh, that's just a circular <coughs> argument. You can't support the Bible with its own, what it, what it says. You, any book could say that. I could write a book right now and say, it is the truth, it is reliable, it is the Word of God, but that doesn't make it the Word of God, right? A circular argument. So that is not the only thing we rely on. But if it is the truth, that doesn't negate the fact that it's still true. Even Jesus said that, you know, even if I am testifying about myself, that doesn't mean it's not true. My testimony is true. So if he's telling the truth, you know, we can rely on that and it will be fulfilled. The things he said will come to pass. And sure enough, they did. When he resurrected from the dead, appeared to over 500 witnesses. There's no doubt. Many people died over this fact. Okay, let's, let's go ahead and look at the verses, Jeremiah 36. Um, I actually want to read the whole passage to you, but it's quite lengthy. Read it on your own, but I want to get you the highlights. So, in, ver in chapter 36 of Jeremiah, he gets a word from the Lord. The first verse, I'll be reading from the KJV, just for fun. It says, And it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah. Remember, Josiah was the king that was king at eight years old. Okay, so this is his son, king of Judah. That the word came unto Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take thee a scroll of a book, and write therein all the words that I have spoken to you against Israel, and against Judah, and against all the nations. So it's not just Judah. It's not just Israel. It's all the nations. He's saying something against and he's saying, write these things down. All the things that I've sp spoken to you from the days of Josiah, even to this day. So he's saying, okay, go back and write down everything I've told you to say. Hope you remember it. Hope you have a good memory. Because God kind of just left them to it, right? At that point. Now, how can we know God's word is sure if he's relying on people to do it? To write it down, to record it? That's the first question you may be asking. And a fair question. But we know, based on other scripture, that God can preserve his own word. And in this passage is a perfect example of how God can preserve his word despite its own destruction. So, let's go ahead and skip up to verse 27. No, back, back up. This is the Holman Christian translation. It says, After the king had burned the scroll with the words Baruch, his scribe, had written at Jeremiah's dictation, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. So you see what happened. The king, upon hearing the scroll read to him, burned it. 
He not only burned it, he cut it up first. He took a knife, and every time they read a passage, he would cut that out and throw it in the fire. He was very intentional about burning this. Because every time, think about how much passage Jeremiah must have been reading to him. If you've read everything from Josiah, his father, to that time, he was burning a lot of scripture. And he was taking his time doing it as he was hearing it. Imagine taking a page out of this. He would cut it out and he would throw it in the fire. Because it was winter time and there was a fireplace going on, just to give a context. So that's what's going on. Verse 28, God says to him, Take another scroll and once again write on it the very words that were on the original scroll that Jehoiakim, king of Judah, burned. Do you think that God was able to preserve his own word, even though he was using people? Do you think that God could use us, even though we're fallible, we're weak, we're, we're, we're rough around the edges, we are, we are not perfect, far from it. God can use us, just like he used Jeremiah. So we have the inspiration of, of God, We have the infallibility, which means it cannot fail. God's word cannot fail. God's word was accomplishing its purpose. It was getting to the king. But later on in, in uh, Jeremiah, we see that. Go ahead and go to the next verse. This is skipping several chapters to chapter 51. But in that chapter 36, Jeremiah continues prophecy that he was not to live past uh, uh, very much longer at all. Let's see. I'm just going to read the last verse. Verse 32 says, Then took Jeremiah another scroll and gave it to Baruch the scribe and the son of Neriah, who wrote therein from the words of the book, which <coughs> Jehoiakim the king of Judah had burned in the fire, and there were added besides unto them many like words. So there was more. God's word was continuing to come out. It wasn't finished. Last week, didn't Pastor Elliot preach on the canonization of Scripture? how the Old Testament was coming together. Okay, This is somewhere in the process where it's still happening. God is still speaking through his prophets, revealing his word, one word at a time. Okay, so this verse is another example of how God's word is preserved. Jeremiah 51, 63 says, When you have finished reading the scroll, this is a different situation, when you have finished reading the scroll, tie a stone around it and throw it in the middle of the Euphrates. So we know for sure that this is not the same as that, because that one was thrown into the river. So we have at least a second, maybe even a third or fourth copy. So we can be sure that the copies are also reliable. We can rely that we have the very words of God. All right. I'll put some of you to sleep. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and hit the next slide. There's two implications of inspiration that I want to bring up. The first is the Bible is a human book. So... Yes, God used man to write his book, mankind. Okay, go ahead. There's a couple other tabs. So authors of the Bible use their own language, their own style, and literary form of writing. So this is true, and we see that in Scripture. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John uh, as four different gospel writers. And that doesn't mean, though, that because they tell it a different way, that it didn't happen or that it's contradictory. We have different people telling their side of the story, just like you have in court. You have different people telling how they saw the crime happen. And all their stories are going to be a little bit different, but it's going to attest to the truth. And that's what the Bible is. It's a testimony of the truth of God. The Bible is influenced by culture in which the author wrote, which we need to study. We need to know history. And the Bible has over 40 authors. How could 40 authors come up with one book and it all be consistent? That doesn't happen in the human world. I mean, in, in our real world, you put 40 people together and you're just going to get a bunch of arguing and fighting. You're not going to have a consistent book. And it was written over a period of 1,500 years. So in the Old Testament, the last prophet, if you haven't heard this before, was written about 500 years before Christ. Listen up, because this is how you tell people the Bible is trustworthy. 500 years before Christ, you have Malachi, you have Isaiah, you have all these different prophets prophesying about Christ. And then 500 years later, he fulfills that. And we're going to see some way he fulfills that. But so, first of all, the implication that it's inspired is that it's a human book. So God is inspiring man to write what he's writing. So hit the next one. 
Secondly, the second implication of inspiration is that the Bible is a divine book. So the implication is that, okay, if it's inspired, then it has to have a divine source. So go ahead and hit the next task. The Bible is inerrant, which means it's without error. Go ahead, hit them all. The Bible is authoritative. The Bible has unity. It's consistent within itself. 66 books, 40 authors over 1,500 years. It's a consistent message that can be compared with itself. No other book in all of history. I don't care what religion. I've looked at them. They are not like the Bible. There is no other religion that can testify of itself, about itself, about Christ, about God, like the Bible. There is no other book. I've already looked. The Bible has an element of mystery. Some of the things can't fully under, be understood yet. Some of the, you think of Revelation. Some of the things in Revelation we won't know until it happens. It's, some of it's a mystery. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on. Isaiah 53 has some interesting prophecies. I don't want to give you some real... Go ahead and hit the next couple tabs. So the testimony of the Old Testament. The Bible testifies of itself in several ways. One of them is through prophecy. In Isaiah 53, we have a prophecy of Jesus. Go ahead and hit like eight tabs. <laughs> so if we were to read Isaiah 53, it would become very evident to you by reading it that this is talking about Jesus. And this was over 500 years before Christ was ever born. It says in verse 2 that he would be a root out of dry ground meaning a royal lineage of David. And that can be seen in Matthew 1.1 1, 1, it's, as it's fulfilled in the, the lineage of Jesus is from the house of David. Verse 2 also says that he would have no form of comeliness. That means he's not a pretty boy. He's a little rough around the edges. He had humble origins. Think about it. He was born in Bethlehem. He was, his parents were poor. Okay, He was a carpenter. And that's fulfilled. He was despised and rejected. Remember how Judas deceived him, gave him over to the, the priests. They slapped him, they whipped him, they, they tore him up, they, they sold his clothes. He was despised and rejected. He suffered for our transgressions. He suffered silently, willingly. Remember, he didn't really give an answer to Pilate who questioned him. And then he was innocent, yet he was executed as a criminal. And that was fulfilled. You see how the Bible is trustworthy? It gives an account of true events of history, not just for our faith, but for actual history. These are actual historical events. Okay, go ahead and hit the next tab. Let's see where we're at. So let's look at some evidence of biblical inspiration. We can tell that it's historically reliable. It fulfilled prophecy. It fulfilled foreshadowing, prefigured uh, of Jesus. And the Bible history itself becomes a prophecy. It's consistent in its doctrine and theology. Who it says God is. And its lack of contradiction. It also gives scientific wisdom from the perspective of the authors. <coughs> Jesus believed it was inspired. What did Jesus say about the Bible himself? I think that would be authoritative, wouldn't it? You want to take a look at what Jesus had to say about Scripture? Just for a second. He says, Don't assume that I came to destroy the law. He's not doing away with the law. No, he says, I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For I assure you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter, nor the one stroke or letter will pass from the law until all things are accomplished. He said, not a comma, not a jot, not any letter will be passed from the law until all things are accomplished. In Matthew 22, 29, Jesus answered them and said, you are deceived because you don't know the scriptures or the power of God. In Luke 21, 33, it says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And he says many, many other things. I'm not going to go over them right now. because What I wanted to do was share with you some things, some ways in which God has allowed me personally to trust him. 
Have you had to trust God in some, some miraculous ways where he's had to show up? Have you? I think sometimes we, we forget those things and we need to be reminded of those. But we need to think back. When did God show up and show us his faithfulness? It's his word that reveals who he is, what he's about, and this is what we can rely on. Some Bibles are not as good translations as others, but some are better. And this one, it has a star every time there's a prophecy about Jesus. I like that because then I can look at it with that kind of knowledge. Oh, I'm looking for Jesus, even though this was years before Jesus was ever born. And I can see that there's prophecy throughout. This lets me know that Jesus is the center of history. And what kind of questions do you have about the, the authenticity or the inerrancy of the Bible? Have you, have you sought to seek them out? Have you given answers to those who have questions? Because we need to have answers to those, and there are answers out there. When there's a seemingly contradiction in the Bible, there are answers to those. But we have to seek that out and we have to figure it out. Maybe not everybody has those questions. But they will, and they'll come to you for the answers. Okay, more thoughts on biblical inspiration. Go ahead and hit the next page and see where we're at. So, I think I mentioned some of this lack of contradiction, scientific wisdom, the quality of the text. Okay, hit the next one. Definition. Here's somebody's definition of inerrancy. The inerrancy of Scripture means that Scripture in the original manuscripts does not affirm anything that is contrary to fact. So, we look at Genesis 1, the creation account. Some would say, oh, that, that didn't really happen in a literal day. Maybe that happened over thousands of years. Then that's saying that God's word is not to be believed as it is written. What was Jesus' argument to Satan's temptation in the desert? It is written. Fill in the blank. He was using his own word to contradict Satan. To call him out. What did Satan say in the Garden of Eden? Hath God really said? So he's questioning God's word from the very beginning. We need to be about the scriptures. And, and maybe we are struggling in our, our desire to really get in the word. If you're struggling with just reading the Bible, what's one thing you could do? Pray that God will give you the desire to, to be more passionate in your spiritual walk. Pray. Sometimes we've got to force feed ourselves. Sometimes that's what they do with babies who are malnutrition. They don't want to eat, so we have to force feed them a little bit to get them started. There are many more things that I want to say uh, on this topic, but I think I'm going to be all over the place if I do, because, because this is really a big topic. Trusting the Word of God. How can we know that we are trusting God's Word? How do we know that we're in the faith? The Bible says to test yourself. Test yourself. Test your faith. Are you really in the faith? And over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be looking at, I think Elliot's going to go back to the canonization and finish out the New Testament canon. We're going to be continuing in this doctrine of the Word of God because it is essential and I want to read for you the Baptist Faith and Message 2000. The very first thing they have in their doctrines, what do you think it is? It's the Word of God, the testimony, the Scriptures, the testimony of the Word of God. And what they say on it is what we all here should be believing. If we, if we hold to this, and they have a bunch of Scripture references, one of them is the verse that we read today. It says, if you will, tell me if you agree with this. Because if you don't, maybe we need to make some adjustments. Maybe we need to change this. Maybe we need to change. It says, the Holy Bible was written by men divinely inspired and is God's revelation of himself to mankind. It is a perfect treasure of divine instruction. It has God for its author, salvation for its end, and truth without any mixture of error 
for its matter. Therefore, all scripture is totally true and trustworthy. It reveals the principles by which God judges us. Therefore, is and will remain to the end of the world. The true center of Christian union and the supreme standard by which all human conduct, creeds, and religious opinions should be tried by the word of God. All scripture is a testimony to Christ, who is himself the focus of divine revelation. Do you agree with that? Maybe you disagree with some of that? There's a lot there. Sorry. But what the psalmist says out of Psalm 119 is, Lord, your word is forever. It's firmly fixed in heaven. So if we want a glimpse of heaven, we need to get a glimpse of what God is saying to us today. And this is what we have. There may be more that God's going to say to us on the other side, but this is what we have that is sure, that is fixed. This is his very word. We want some sort of divine revelation from God. We want some sort of special you know, interaction, some sort of spiritual experience that goes beyond comprehension. This is God's word, and this will give us the source for all matters in life and history that we need to know. All right, so trusting in God's word. Are you aligning yourself with the word of God? Are you trusting in what you're reading? First of all, you got to be reading it in order to make those you know, kinds of judgments. God's word is the standard of truth. So are we judging ourselves by its standard? John 17 says, your word is truth. So it's not just true, but it is truth. It is the definition of truth. It defines truth. Think of the creation of the world. God speaks and it happens. He says something and it is true. It is happening. Think about that as you read God's word. As God breathed creation into existence, it happened. He also breathed these words into existence and will give us life. So we align ourselves with his word as we read it. We realize, hey, that doesn't jive with the way I was living. So do I need to change what I'm reading or do I need to change myself? And I would say, please, don't change the Bible. Change yourself, the way you're living. Repentance is the word. So we align ourselves with his word, and we're aligning himself with his creative order. The final testimony that God has is the Holy Spirit within us. I don't like to think that we uh, judge God's word just based on an internal thing being the Holy Spirit. But it is God's word that allows us to understand what we're reading. And he, he what is the word? He gives us life. He gives us life so that when we read his word, it comes alive off the page and it speaks directly to us in our situation. God's Holy Spirit is a testimony in and of itself. It testifies to us. It convicts us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So the Holy Spirit is also testifying of God's word and its authority and its inerrancy. But don't only rely on the Holy Spirit. Also rely on what it says because it, it talks about itself. It's historically accurate. It's it is the Word of God. It, there is no other book like it. How, how, how many times can I say it? It is the Word of God. Proclaim it in everywhere you go, everyone you talk to, because it will give them life. I'm going to wrap this up. So we're getting out a little bit early today, but maybe that will give you time to shovel your neighbor's driveway or something. So, oh, stay on this page right here. I just want you to see this. Maybe you can't even see it because it's kind of hard to read. This is textual evidence for ancient manuscripts. Okay, this is something that's really important to me. And I think it is to you. It should be to you, too. Okay, so, like, down the middle we have, uh, we have Aristotle, Herod, Herod, Herodotus, Homer, Plato. You know uh, Plato? There's only 15 copies of Plato's works. Yet we read him in college and all these scholarly works. And, and, and they really exalt him. What about... Uh, you know, some of these others. Julius Caesar. We only have ten copies of what he... And the oldest copy we have was 950 years after he existed. That's almost a thousand years. Yeah. Gap. Okay, what about Aristotle? We read a lot about him. There's only five copies in existence. Five copies. And there's a 1,400 year gap between the last, the oldest copy we have. How do we even know it was really Aristotle who wrote it? 
with that big of a gap. Well, they could have made it up. We'd never know the difference. When we go down to the Old Testament and the New Testament, I want you to see something here that's different from all the rest. Old Testament, 5,000 copies. And the oldest copy we have, 250 B.C. That's about two to 400 years gap between when it was written and when the copy was that we have estimated to be. All right, 5,000 copies. you see any other thing even approaching 5,000? No. New Testament. It was written around, the oldest copy we have is about 125 A.D. That's about a 50-year gap between when we think the latest one was written. And we have 8,000 manuscripts. Can that testify to the truth of the Bible? We have a reliable copy of the Word of God. And where there are errors, it doesn't change the meaning of the text. It's like, oh, there's a little bit of dash there, or this letter looks like that letter, but it doesn't change the meaning of the word. Like you have a trunk of a car, you have a trunk of a tree, you have a trunk of an elephant, it's still a trunk. I'm just trying to use a little bit of syntax to get you thinking that in the context of a sentence, we know what it says. All right, go to the next slide, because I want to show you this. This is a timeline of when the Dead Sea Scrolls... Anybody go see the Dead Sea Scrolls when they came to town, to the Crown Center? I wish I had, because th that was probably a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. If you look at... Here's 0 AD. The oldest manuscripts we, manuscripts we had before the Dead Sea Scrolls was about 700 AD. Those are the only, oldest manuscripts we had before we found the Dead Sea Scrolls. When the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in, what was it, the 70s or whatever, those were dated to 200 or 300 B.C., and they testified to the accuracy of God's word. It had not changed from 300 B.C. to 700, 800 A.D. We know that they kept meticulous records, they made meticulous copies, because the word of God did not change over that length of time. So we can rely on God for preserving his word, whether it's fire, whether it's years, whether it's man's criticism of this Bible, philosophical criticism, you know, whatever man does to tear it down, it still stands. It doesn't make it any different. It still stands. Go to the next slide. So, so I already said the testimony of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, so we're pretty much wrapping up here. I want you to think about this. How can your reliance on the Word of God encourage your faith? Have you? Can you think about this in any depth that, that how we rely on God's Word Maybe we've criticized, or maybe we've heard some criticism, of it. and maybe it's allowed us to not be as uh, not hold God's word up as high as we should. So what I'm asking you to stand on God's word. We're going to higher ground. That's what we're going to be singing next. So God's word is up here. It's fixed in heaven. If you stand on those truths, you will be on higher ground. So stay with me as we sing. We're going to close out with higher ground. If you have a decision to make today. Come forward, you can pray. Whatever you need to do to get right with God. Pray for more fervency, more fire, Holy Spirit. Pray for me, for each other, and, and let's let's uh let's change this community for Christ.
Let them know that the word of God is reliable. It's trustworthy. Put everything they have in this. It's like the investment that's guaranteed. <laughs> Retirement benefits are great, right? <laughs> well, let's pray as we go out and uh, have a blessed day. Father God, we thank you so much for your word, which is true, which we can stand on, which does take us to a higher level. It changes minds. It transforms people into a new creation. Lord, I pray that that continually continues to happen within us, around us, and that people would know that we are the people of God. Lord, forgive us when we fail, when we foul up, when we mess up, and help us to remember that that's just you keeping us humble so that we can rely on you. We thank you for your word. Help to keep us from stumbling. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.